you grew up in Oneida. What was growing up in Oneida like? Because you were probably one of a few African Americans in the city at that point in time. At the time that I grew up in Oneida, almost anybody of color who lived in the city was a relative. Um, and I would dare say there were maybe one, two, three, five African American families. Make that six. There was, oh, well, I'm, I'm adding up, so I'm seven. We're up to seven. And of, the, of that seven, five were related to me. Two were not, the Charlestons and the Rileys. Okay. Still dear friends after all this time, but <laughs> yeah. So, um, talk about what growing up was like in a, in a predominantly Caucasian community. Was there a lot of problems? Did you not notice it? Or if you did notice it, when did you notice any issues? It, it, it's kind of a, a full circle for me because the experiences that I had growing up in Oneida later as a young adult and as a, uh, you know, a young man um, led me to want to get involved in civic affairs and get involved in my community largely because of how positive I felt. Really? Um, I've been somewhat surprised and shocked over the years as I've heard people talking about or even voicing concerns about people who maybe came from a, a mixed race marriage and were living in a largely white community and people have heard people offer, you know, well, it must be hard for the children or this and that. That's almost difficult for me to understand, really, because that certainly wasn't part of my experience in terms of um, being meted out in that fashion. So, for me, I think, well, this, is, this interview is such a trip for me. It's taking me places I haven't opened up and opening doors I haven't opened in a long time. I became aware <clears throat> that I wasn't the same as the other children, that there, were, that there was a difference about me. Probably at about three years of, old, of age, I was playing in the sandbox at Higginbotham Park and there were some other children in there with me and they were making quite a fuss about the fact that my skin wasn't the same color as theirs. And I kind of never really paid attention to that before that. And I can, to this day, and it's been probably, what, some 66 years ago, um, <clears throat> one of the little boys saying, yeah, but look, the bottoms of his hands and the bottoms of his feet and his hands are the same color as us. <laughs> and for some reason, that was an anomaly that, that kind of resonated with them. And what came away, the, away from it for me, I think from that day forward, I kind of knew that I was a little different. Um, one of the things that I'm really happy about <clears throat> is that Growing up in Oneida gave me a perspective about race and about racism and bigotry and those kinds of things that is somewhat different than many other people experience in larger urban areas. My view is that folks in urban areas who are living largely amongst other minority people, um, when they encounter racism or they encounter those the things that that you know, many African American people struggle with, um, it's easy to just blame a universal them. Um, yesterday at an ecumenical service that I attended, the keynote speaker <clears throat> was sharing how she reached a point because she grew up in an urban southern place and it, she reached a point in her life where she felt like she hated all white people based upon how she had been treated, how she had seen others treated, and what she thought the reality was. Well, growing up in Oneida, in little Madison County, taught me at a very young age that yes, there's, there's racism out there. There's, differences are not always celebrated but it allowed me to put that into a broader context because I didn't see a, at least in my child's mind, and maybe in somewhat in my mind now, I didn't see a significant difference in terms of the, a certain amount of meanness or a certain amount of 
te teasing or poking fun or those things that children do between my black skin and the kid who is missing an arm or the kid who struggled with weight. As I look back in my childhood, almost every single child in my neighborhood had a nickname and those nicknames usually derive from their differences. Sometimes, cooling stuff. There was one kid who had a dramatic overweight. So he had a tendency to kind of be messily and good. We called him phony. Because when he eats vegetables and stuff, the ice cream would run down his face. You know, there was another child, and I still know these fellas. Um, there was another guy who, you know, he had a little bit of a weight problem. We called him cover. You know, um, the black kid might be spook. The next guy, literally, there was a kid who grew up who, uh, I won't mention his name, but I know it well, and he had a birth defect where he had no arm from the elbow down, and we called him single wing. I mean, so what that kind of taught me was, yeah, you've got some things to deal with, but it's, everybody has something to deal with, and at the core of it, we're still all the same. So I learned very early on that I could not judge all people with one, paint everybody with one broad stroke. I had to know people on an individual basis and individually determine how they were gonna treat me. And along the way, I would treat everybody the same and then evaluate as we went forward. Oh, this is a person I can befriend. That's someone who doesn't like me or whatever. And, um, the beauty of that for me is it allowed me to leave this community and go out into the broader world and not have a, an innate bias that all white people were against me and not to be trusted. That's a real advantage. There are some others. Um, it's my strongly felt opinion that most people in the broader majority of our society. I'm not sure what kind of terms to use to talk about some of this stuff sometimes. But <clears throat> um, lost my train of thought. Uh, you were talking about uh, your experiences and people in the broader society, how they react to things. Oh, most people out there in the broader world don't know as much about African Americans and African American society as we as, as the converse of that. Um, we tend to know more and understand more. But the individual who grows up in a small um, rural community that's mixed in takes that to a whole new level. If there's, I have my master's degree in understanding. So that allows me to do and be things that many other African American people can't pull off. I can talk to someone on the phone because I've called customer service somewhere for something. I know immediately it's an African American on the phone with me. And over and over again, I'll, I'll say, well, so how's, it, how's the weather there? Just kind of getting to, am I right? And almost always I'm right. I can talk to anybody on the phone and avoid their knowing my race by choice. That can be an advantage. So those kinds of benefits have accrued to me from living in a situation that was as well as it could be integrated. And I'm a big proponent and a big believer in that because largely it's that that we don't understand that we make into boogeymen. So you graduated in Ida High School. No, actually. Oh. I never went to public school day oh. in my life. Well, that's not true. I went to kindergarten at um, Willard F. Pryor, okay. at which point my um, intensely conservative and convicted Christian mother determined that after one year of, Christ of, of uh, kindergarten, she could see that public school was going to be my spiritual downfall. <laughs> and I was high in, headed on the highway to hell. <laughs> at, at five years old, and she'd better get me into an institution that could have uh, hammered some, some Christianity and some Jesus in me, even with the math. <laughs> so, I went to a series of uh, parochial schools that uh, were 
run by Seventh-day Adventists and were in various places around the central New York community, uh, none of them were ever close. So first grade was at a, an interesting little building on Genesee Street in Utica. And I would take the New York Central Railroad bus line, oh, bus line from downtown Oneida to Utica every day and back. Um, you wouldn't see that happening today. Yeah. Where, where three kids under the age of nine years old get on a public bus with no adult supervision and drive and go 25 miles away. Yeah, that's so. <clears throat> and, but it was an interesting experience because I remember that first schoolhouse. In many ways, I, I'm a guy who, you know, uh, I transcended kind of a cusp. I was a cusp between the past and the mo and old and modern. That first school was a little throwback school that it, it actually ended up, it, it sat where the old IBM building used to be on Genesee Street. And um, it was torn down by probably 61 or two and it was a red school building that sat there way toward the back of the property. Um, a, a boys bathroom, a girls bathroom, a little entry hall with place to hang your coats, one room with wrought iron desks with ink wells and tops that are heavy wooden that came up, one teacher, eight grades. I think there were 12, 15 students. Not many people go to school like that anymore. <laughs> so, where did you graduate from then? So, I hopped around a lot. I went to that school, there was a fire or something, they, then they, they built a church over in North Utica, which simply meant that I had to get off the New York Central bus and take a local bus to get out there. <laughs> so we, that got a little more complicated. and. Um, I went there for third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. Then they had a transformation of something. They, they bought an old school building, which is still there, but it's an apartment complex now of sorts, in Fort Stanwix. And I went to Stanwix from fifth through ninth grade. Tenth through twelfth, <clears throat> I went to Union Springs Academy which is an Adventist high school in Union Springs, New York. It's and like was, Cayuga oh, County. Yeah, in Cayuga County. It was a boarding school. I was going to say, did you live there? And uh, I was going to say, unique. In some ways, I've had a totally unique experience. So from the age of 14 till after I finished college, I was very seldom home. Um, I, I have to share, I, I, I don't think it's necessarily the best idea for 14-year-olds to not be with their parents. But we would go, uh, you know, in, uh, when sc school started in the first week of September, and you'd come home for a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and go back to school Sunday evening every two months or something like that, every seven or eight weeks, you'd get a weekend home. Um, and because it was so expensive and we were poor, I would spend summers there working. We made brooms, we had a broom factory, piece rate. Dangerous job for a 15 year old. <laughs> but we made brooms or did other jobs to keep the campus going and whatnot. And that's where I graduated from in uh, May of 72. Okay, so then you go to, I got this one written down, Atlantic Union College. Actually, no. No? Then I go to Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan. Why there? It was just an Adventist school that I chose. Uh, at that time, uh, my mom is still Adventist, and there are many of my relatives, and one of the little known facts about Seventh-day Adventism is that they have the second largest educational system, religious-based educational system in the world, second only to Catholics. And so they have colleges all over the place. Around here, most people would go to Atlantic Union College, which I went to later. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be different. 
and a buddy of mine that I'd been a roommate with, <clears throat> whose folks were from Manlist, had decided he was going to go to Andrews. And I knew I could hitch a ride with him, so I was Andrews bound. Um, given its location, Berrien Springs, Michigan is not far from the Indiana border. You know, we'd go over to Notre Dame once in a while <laughs> and just kind of you know, we'd hitchhike into Notre Dame and raise hell or whatever. But um, it was very close to Detroit and Chicago and all of that. Um, I frankly only lasted about, I lasted one semester there and decided I was out of there. Um, it was a period in time where I was kind of trying to find myself and decide who I was and what I experienced when I left Madison County is if you weren't an urban African American, your, your credentials as African American were somehow called into question. You're, you're not supposed to be able to talk like I talk or act like I acted and know about hunting and skinning rabbits and <laughs> all those kinds of activities um, if you're African American. You're supposed to be from Chicago or Detroit or Rochester or Buffalo or whatever. And then I showed up on campus with a white roommate and didn't give enough obeisance to the Black Student Union and other, you know, and it was the late, early 70s, you know, Martin Luther King had only been dead, shot a few years previously and, boy, they just took a dislike to me. That was some kind of Uncle Tom. And I decided I didn't want to deal with that. So I left, and that's when I went out to, so I, I went there one semester, then I transferred out to Atlantic Union College in South Lancaster, Mass. So you spent time away from Madison County. Did you ever think you were going to move somewhere besides Madison County, or did you always plan to come back? I had no plans to come back. Okay. <laughs> I thought for sure. At that point in my life, uh, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but Oneida was not in it. <laughs> I was going somewhere and, you know, find my fame and fortune, you know, as young men have dreams and all that business. So at the time I was an English major, but I had taken to singing quite a bit and I liked choirs and things like that, so I always auditioned for the college choirs and this and that and the other. When I went out to AUC, I met this guy who had a PhD in conducting and piano performance from the Juilliard School. And uh, he had been a child prodigy. He was an African American man, you know. And uh, I remember somebody showing old films or something of him playing on the Mickey Mouse show when he was seven years old or something. And this guy played, you know, Carnegie Hall and did concert tours in Europe and all this stuff. And I was just completely in awe of him. And he pulled me aside one day and said, listen, I think if uh, you stay with it and you've got, a, you've got some singing talent, I'd like to see you at least to change your major, at least do a double major. And uh, I'm going to work to get you an audition at the Juilliard School. And from that point on, my dream was to be Luciano. <laughs> And I gotta ask, what happened? Life. <laughs> <laughs> so when when you graduated from Atlantic Union, where did you go? I didn't graduate. Oh, okay. That all unraveled. He, um, you know, this was still a fairly conservative Adventist institution. He um, he had married a lady who was Haitian royalty or whatever, landed black Haitian family. <laughs> I remember one time we did a concert. I would go into the Boston Conservatory of Music and pick up students to flesh out our orchestra and whatnot. And he brought in these people from New York City, from Juilliard, to sing the lead roles. It was just glorious. Uh, we were either doing, what were we doing? I can still remember that piece of all the way back to the 70s. We were doing Ross, Rossini's Stop at Mater. A uh, glorious piece of music. Anyway, um, afterward, there was a gathering at his home, and I remember going in his, 
you know, he would he would conduct with these big ruffled shirts and all of that business. And we, he invited some of us over to his house, some of the students he was friends with. I mean, there were faculty there and all that business. And we get there, and his mother-in-law was in town. And his wife and mother-in-law came to the door, or either, excuse me, either at the door or as we were being ushered into where people were gathering. And both of these ladies offered me their hand for kissing. My Madison County really came out. I was like, what? What am I doing, huh? <laughs> I'd never been exposed to anything like this in my life. It was, it was something. Anyway, that was the first night. And he began to tell stories about how this tenor had shown up who was, um, <clears throat> was a wonderful coloratura soprano named uh, Joan Sutherland. She was just, oh my God. <coughs> <laughs> anyway, she had this young protege, and he had come to New York City and done his audition at the Met, and he sang Don uh, Donizetti's Daughter of the Regiment. No one had performed the piece in a hundred years because it was way too difficult. Nine high seas in a row and all that. And they, they had a recording, and they played it, and that was the first time I had ever heard Luciano Pepperotti. I was... That was it. I was mesmerized. So I hung in there. I got in some academic issues, social, well, they were more like social issues. It was a very conservative school. I was not conservative. <laughs> so they decided that we needed to have a parting of the ways for a while while I decided how to properly behave, which meant you're not, you know, you're not drinking and going to parties and smoking and all the other stuff that kind of young college guys tend to get up to from time to time. <laughs> well, anyway, I, so I came home, stayed a semester in Oneida, re-enrolled re and went back to school, and in the meantime, he had had a falling out at that school and just kind of disappeared. Um, I don't, I'm looking back on it, I don't know what happened if I tried to track him down or anything like that, but I was devastated. And since the operatic world, classical world, was not something that I was really familiar with, I just kind of got lost. I went to OCC for a semester or two, trying because I heard they had a quite a significant music program, but it just didn't feel good to me. Ended up going to Virginia for a, and living in the Blue Ridge Mountains in a place called New Market, Virginia, for a year. That was an experience. And while, it was, while he was there, while I was there, I heard about another Adventist school over in um, oh, Tacoma Park, Maryland, called uh, uh, Columbia Union College. So I went there. They had a, a black tenor who had come from Cuba and was trying to make some noise in the vocal scene. And I, was, I thought, this guy's pretty something, so I'm going to go over and take instruction from him. So I went over there to school, and while I was there, uh, Dr. Robertson, which is the gentleman's name from the previous school, came and did a concert, and I got to see him again. And it was kind of a stilted, kind of tense thing. I went backstage after his production, or after his thing performance, and I stood in line with others who were trying to get autographs or whatever. And, he turned around and he looked at me and he just started smiling. He walked up and he said, you still got that instrument in your, in your chest? I said, yep. And that was the last time I have spoken to him. Um, moved back to Oneida, kind of trying to find myself at that point. And uh, fell in love with a gal from Canastota and needed to get a job. and you know, do some of those mundane things, work and a family might be coming along and here I sit. <laughs> so when did you start to get active in civic duty? Like when, when did that start to pique your interest? It didn't for a while. I, there was a time in Madison County where I literally did not know a blessed living soul other than some of my relatives lived in Peterborough. And I was a People don't believe it, but I was a pretty shy fellow. And uh, I was working with the ARC. My, my wife and I uh, were working as the adult 
you know, staff, if you will, live-in staff at a, um, an ARC home on, uh, oh, just past the creek there on Route 5 okay. in Wampsville. And uh, that's kind of what I did, you know, and that was that. And one day my wife's reading the newspaper and hears that the United City Hospital is going to get involved in some kind of a fundraiser thing called Follies. And she determines that I'm going to go and participate in the Follies and start to engage with the United Community and meet people and all that. And I protested. Uh, but I've, over the years, there have very, been very few protests with that woman that I've ever won. <laughs> so I ended up in the Follies, and uh, I'll never forget the first person that I met who was so good to me and kind of was welcoming because I didn't know a soul was this fellow named Peter Hedgelot, who walked up and introduced himself and was Peter. Do you know Peter? <laughs> he hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> and. Uh, so I was in a couple of, of those, and I started to meet a few people in the community, and people, you know, came to understand that I could sing a little bit or whatever, and <clears throat> kind of what all came together is right about that same time, the ARC also decided that they, uh, they wanted to do some public relations kind of stuff that they hadn't done in the past. And I applied for the position and was able to convince them that I would do a good job at that. And then I really set out trying to um, represent ARC and its mission in, in Madison County as best I could. And for me that meant I need to join civic organizations, I need to go where people are gathering and all of that. And somewhere in the, in the mix of all that, so at one point I was uh, a Canastoto lion, I was uh, a Rotarian, I was in the United Community Chest. I was on the Madison County Historical Board. I was just kind of everywhere. Then I started doing some work for um, Seneca Tuscarora uh, District Boy Scouts of America, which was a real community thing because I d d didn't have any sons. But I felt like this is something worthy. And uh, that was an experience because I would go to all of the blue and gold moving up ceremonies and things that they had anywhere in a two county range. So I would I could show up in, you know, a Methodist church basement in Remsen. Nobody knew who was showing up. And they're having a family cookout gathering and in walks this black guy. <laughs> um, representing the district. For me it was, you know, I was Madison County born and raised. It was not an issue for me. I was going anywhere I needed to go and be me and but even though you're doing that you got to you know you, you got to be kind of blind to not notice from time to time that <laughs> people are a bit taken aback or whatever and I just kind of let let that settle or whatever and do my thing um army currency was mayor and it began to occur to me that maybe I wanted to do something that was a little more directly involved. So I started asking. I knew nothing about what it was to run for a city council or any of that stuff. So I uh, went over to City Hall and started talking with some people. I met a fellow who was on the City of Ohio Democratic Committee and expressed some interest. As is, it was typical then, and probably is typical now, they were really looking for people to run for city council. And uh, I said, yeah, I'll be willing to do that. And I committed to run for city council. And, and uh, yeah, the rest was it. I just, then it kind of took on a life of its own. So what was your experience like as a councilman? Did you um, spearhead any initiatives? What was your goal going into it? My goal going into it <clears throat> was just to try to get to know the issues and represent the people of my ward in the city with integrity and openness and see where that went. Um, it was a bit of an interesting journey because in my first run, I overheard the mayor 
and one of the leaders of the city democratic committee having a conversation about how there was no way I could win. But they were just pleased to have a body running in the Ward 3. But I would be soundly defeated um, because I was running against this guy named Angie Ottaviano. And Angie had been, you know, a you know, lifelong United policeman who was well liked and was had started United Pop Warner football, and this was going to be an insurmountable task. That angered me. So I worked probably harder than I'd ever worked. I remember I had two little kids and we would go knocking on doors campaigning as a family. My wife, the two babies, and me. And the wife, I'd be talking to somebody and the kids would be in the strollers at the steps. I didn't really stop to think about how that all played at the time. I think if someone came to my house now and that was their shtick, I would be really impressed. I did it, to be honest with you, because I needed the moral support because <laughs> I was chicken. Well, and it's funny, we kind of just went through that again with the judge race in that, you know, they went door to door to get votes. Yeah. So, but, so how long were you a councilman? I was a councilman on and off. Okay. Uh, altogether, I think 14 years, oh, wow. probably seven terms, but they came, I served one or two terms um, in, in the currency administration and then he began to do and say some things that I felt strongly opposed to and I felt like I couldn't run on that ticket because to run on that ticket was a de facto endorsement of someone that I wasn't going to vote for for mayor and so when I expressed that opinion it was met with real dismay people just don't mean this is not what you do you can't do this you, you so what you just run for your office and keep your mouth shut and do what you're supposed to do, represent your ward, and don't worry about the rest of it. I said, I, I can't do that. So I didn't run. Um, I did something like, I think I ran in a not very well thought out or implemented independent campaign for county supervisor and got beaten by I thought the worst candidate that I'd ever seen run for public office, and he beat me. <laughs> anyway, so I was out for two years, and then I decided I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to change my party, and I'm going to run for Ward 3 as a Republican. And at that point, I was told, oh, this is not going to work. Um, <coughs> voters of your ward will never tolerate that. Uh, and I had an uphill climb again because now I was running against Mike Romano who was the math teacher at the high school and again well liked and uh, lo and behold I changed parties went as a Republican and win again um, I served for I think two terms so that would have been three altogether and then um, two or three, and I ended up taking a job in Albany. So I left town for five years. Then I came back. <laughs> and what brought you back? Uh, my initial plan had been that we were going to relocate to Slingerlands or someplace out in the Capital District and live happily ever after. And uh, family didn't want to leave Odida. Okay. So you, you're after, back? After about five years, I said, okay, this is not working. And you guys Well, so you no, were going to Albany and they were staying to, here. Yeah. I was in Albany. I had an apartment, and I was in Albany five days a week, most weeks, or four. And then I'd come home on Friday nights and go back either Sunday night or Monday morning. And that was going to only, initially, that was only supposed to last a couple of years. My oldest will have graduated high school because she didn't want to leave. She was, you know, I think when I started all this, she was a sophomore and didn't want to leave on Ida High. Okay, I accepted that excuse. So, <coughs> excuse me, two years later, she's going off to college and there's no movement. <laughs> Eventually, I just realized this is never going to happen. So, and then I, you know, I ran into some issues at that job and ended up needing to move on came back to Oneida and uh, wasn't here very long before I 
dip my toe back into politics again. And as a city councilman? As a city councilman. What made you, so what, you were appointed deputy mayor? You're not elected deputy mayor. You're right. I, on the way over here, I was thinking about all that came to be. And every once in a while, I run into the fellow who was responsible almost solely for me ever being mayor of the city of Oneida. And he has no idea. And when I see him, I'm going to let him know. Um, Dan Jones. Okay. And uh, he had run for councilman that year. On the Democratic side, I'm a Republican. And typically in the city of Oneida, on those kinds of issues and, and others, everything would break out according to party lines. Probably not different here. I mean... If you had a majority of the supervisors who were Democrat, you'd probably have a Democrat chairman. In the city of Oneida that year, we did just the opposite. So in the past, there are all the times I'd been there, whoever was the ranking councilman from the party of the mayor would be elected deputy. Well, that year, there were a lot of newcomers to the city council, and I had quite a bit of, an exper of experience. And Dan Jones, who was a Democrat, nominated a, Repub a Republican to be deputy mayor. Well, there was almost a free-for-all over it. And in typical Dan fashion, he said, I don't care. I think man's the best, Max is the best qualified out of any of us, and he's getting my vote. And his vote was what swung it over, so I was elected deputy mayor. And that was under Don Hudson? That was under Don um, Don Hudson. Was he, uh, so Don died of cancer. Actually, Don was a Republican, but at that point, we probably didn't have enough Republican seats to elect me, enough Republican votes. So it would have taken a Democrat voting with us to seat me as deputy mayor, and Dan did that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, then, unfortunately, um, halfway, th not quite halfway through his first year in office, uh, Don, he passed. And you became the first African American to hold and the office of mayor. mayor. Um, talk about what that was like. Did, did you get any? <coughs> I'm going to say shenanigans. Um, being the first African American mayor, did it move move pretty smoothly? It's kind of startling because, to be honest with you, most of the conversations, I guess, or even the things I hear about that are said and done, or the, the, the issues that swirl around blackness just have never been part of my experience here. It never comes up. It's never been an issue. Uh, it's kind of startling, really. I mean, people will ask me questions and I'll, I'll think, hmm, what am I supposed to make of that? It, I, I, never, I never mentioned it. I didn't run as the first African-American mayor. I ran as Max from Oneida think people voted because it's Max and I know him from here. And well, and then you defeated, when you <laughs> ran for the position, um, you defeated a guy who had been mayor a couple times before, had you not? Yes. And uh, so now you're the elected mayor, you're not the, the replacement for Don. Right. Were you able to do anything that, that, that you ha wanted to do but maybe hadn't been able to do in your previous years on, uh, on, the, on the board? I was actually a bit surprised at how much of a difference there is between being mayor as opposed to city council. Okay. I don't think those people who are on the city council serving, and I had served a number of terms as city councilman, uh, even understand what that is until you're in that chair. It, it's different, and it makes a difference. Um, the goals that, that I had really, you, you know, Oneida had, had been struggling with some of the same Rust Belt issues that so many communities across the Northeast were struggling with. Not enough good paying jobs, loss of traditional places to work, you know, I give you Oneida Limited, things like that. Um, and so my intent was, how do we, how do we tackle this? How do we how do we deal with some of these, with these really issues that, that tend to undermine what our goals are? So for me, you know, codes enforcement and trying to deal with, you know, um, the perception of, 
of you know a lot of nefarious petty crimes and 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 uh, you know low income housing issues if you want to call it that that was big on my agenda um, and I had a perception that if we were going to tackle some of the things that we needed to tackle um, we couldn't do it incestuously uh, a mayor of Oneida needed to leave Oneida and reach out to a broader world and find out what's happening out there you know tap into greater power bases Albany <laughs> comes to mind and, and, and let it be known, hey, we're out here, and we have dreams and aspirations and goals and things, and maybe you can help. <laughs> you know? So that's kind of what I set out to do, and in, in a lot of ways it worked. So you served the one term. Um, you are primaried, I believe? I served the one term. I'm primaried because at the end of that term I became disillusioned at that point with, with the Republicans. And I wanted to move back to the Democratic side. Okay. And I did that. Um, I was being welcomed, but at the end of the day, and I've seen this happen on both sides of the aisle to people, Nancy Lorraine Hoffman dealt with the same thing or whatever. The, you know, parties oftentimes say that they welcome you and they want you to come over from another party. But once you're there and you're not, you know, the opposition anymore in that position of power, then you get undermined. <laughs> so I think I might have reconsidered that that move if I knew that you know well existing powers within the city of Oneida were going to work to make sure that I wasn't mayor again. I mean, that didn't make a whole lot of sense. Right. So I got primaried, and um, I was being primaried against Leo Matsky, who certainly had a strong Democratic base. And he beat me, and that was, you know. So you kind of get out of politics for a little bit, and then you come back in when um, Tom Boylan steps down. Yes. Uh, and you became a, the first African American to be uh, a board supervisor for Madison County. Now it was it was pretty brief. It was August to December. But talk about what that experience was like. All of these experiences were for me. Um, real moments of pride. Um, we've talked here, or at least I've shared with you, that at no point along the way did I feel like, one, my blackness was an impediment. I also didn't feel like it was anything that needed to be specifically pointed out or addressed in any way. However, it was not lost upon me that I was doing something and being something that no one before me who looked like me had done. And uh, I'm proud of that. Um, I guess I wouldn't put it in a way that speaks to me. I would put it in, when, when people ask me about <clears throat> what it was like being mayor and what do I remember the most fondly, Largely it was that a community, the community that I was, was raised in, the people living in that community had enough faith and belief in me that they would honor me with that responsibility. That's something I'll always carry with me as a real thing of pride. So I, you and I have talked many times off camera. Um, I am a firm believer in the yin and yang of history that, so my next part question is kind of two part. What do you feel was the high point in, when you were in any of your elected positions and what do you feel was the low point when you were in any of your elected positions? The high points of my, I'm gonna lump some decisions that I made as a city councilor okay. in with that. <clears throat> the high point was I was always one who for whatever reason was able to um, to make the tough vote, to, 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 to make a vote which was sometimes largely unpopular, but I felt was principled. I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you, I don't think there's a lot of that. And that's something I'm really proud of. <clears throat> it's one thing to simply vote that which your constituents want. It's another thing 
to make votes that you genuinely believe are in the best interest of your entire constituency, regardless of what a few people might want. Um, I remember at one point I was there was a petition brought to me to um, not allow further development of the end of um, was it Sylvan? I don't think it's Sylvan. Yeah, where the duplexes are now. Oxford and where the duplexes yeah. are now. Um, and the argument that was being put forth was that those people who had bought houses at the end of that street had never imagined that there'd be other houses there and they liked the deer that came along and, and it was so pristine and lovely and all of that and I there was a big push to not because I was their ward councilman to not support further development there when in fact we had always designed the paper streets they still have been completed to this day, but there were paper streets there uh, in the planning department. Those were supposed to be housing units, and in providing those housing units, we increase the population, we increase the tax base, and we provide really nice housing opportunities for people. It's not as if the, we turned that place into slums. I was proud of that vote. What was the low point? The low point was my proposal to put solar panels in Oneida Heights. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have friends that live up there. I'm well aware of that one. <laughs> they were livid with me. <laughs> uh, in that, I'll tell you, is another thing I'm proud of. It's come to me that even in the current situation at City Hall, most administrations kind of design their own um, how are we going to sit? How are we going to interface with the population and that kind of thing? I chose to sit at the lowest level with all my councilmen and people to my left, all of us on the same level of the dais. Some chose to be above. I kind of didn't like the message that sent. I'm not above you. Um, and I also allowed there to be a fairly significant amount of dialogue and, and conversation, if you will, statements from the general public. As long as those statements were done in a way which was respectful of the serious business that's being conducted there. Um, decisions that are gonna serve our community. So within that context, I would allow people a fairly significant amount of time to speak. And during this, um, I sat there while people well, individual after individual after individual after individual rose to their feet to deride me in the strongest, most, and many times unseemly manner. And uh, I allowed them to, and I didn't try to shut it off, and I sat there and took it. One of the hardest things I ever did in my life. So, Madison County is unique in that we are a almost always have been a largely largely Caucasian community but we have this unique history in New York State and the United States in that we hosted two conventions that in some ways changed the course of history the first New York State Anti-Slavery Society meeting gets kicked out of Utica and ends up in Peterborough and then uh, 15 17 years later we have the Fugitive Slave Law Convention in Casanova, which um, they tried to do some things that didn't work out, but they ended up being national news in both cases. Um, you've been involved with, with preserving that heritage and talking about the people um, that made their way to P Peterborough, the, the people of color, um, whether it be Harriet Russell or Harriet Russell? Harriet Russell. Mm -hmm. um, talk about your desire to not only preserve that history but promote it and why it's important well I share your opinion that some very significant things took place in Madison County and and there are there are some uniquely positive things about Madison County that I would that I feel good about running up the flagpole whenever I can I wish I had a bigger forum to do so because 
oftentimes we have these perceptions that to be rural is to be unreasonable, to be rural is to be intolerant. Um, there certainly is that out there, but I think it needs to be pointed out. When you take Madison County, I'm going to guesstimate, but if you include Asians, African Americans, and, and Native Americans, we don't represent 10% of the population. I think it was like 3% the last census. Okay, so if I go 7%, that's high. Yep. <clears throat> and we are a largely Republican leaning group of, of voters. If you look our at our voter registration countywide, it's more Republican than it is Democrat. Yet in spite of that, Madison County elected a Democrat sheriff three times. Four times? I forget how long Allen was, was sheriff, but it had to be at least three times. Uh, 2009 to 2016, 17. Yeah, so there's a, they're, they're two year terms, so they must have elected. No, their sheriffs are four. Oh, they're four. Okay, so they elected. But him I think twice. he had been elected to his third and then. <clears throat> right, and then changed. So they elected him two, three times. And, and that's, Pretty significant. That's unique in and of itself because I'd have to look back and look, but I believe he's the only the second African-American to be elected sheriff in New York State. It was in, when he first won the election, there was an article that newspapers can sometimes not always be the most accurate, but mm -hmm. Madison County has a unique history. We had the first woman elected as county clerk, uh, was from Madison County. She unfortunately passed away within eight months of, of winning the election. Um, but, but Al was, you know, first, or second or third African-American across New York State to be elected sheriff uh, and again, as you said, as a Democrat, and there hadn't been one in like, no, as like a Democrat, 100 years. In this rural county yeah. and as an African American. Um, during the entire time that I ran for office, my ethnicity was almost completely out of mind for me. That was not something that was part of the equation. So when you put that into the context of who we are, um, I think it, it kind of undercuts some of the arguments that offer that sometimes are offered and causes causes one to have to re-examine what really is going on here then. Do we have prejudices? Yes. Do we have predilections? Yes. But they may not be what we thought they were. And they might manifest in different ways than we stereotypically want to believe. I think that's good knowledge. Um, but more importantly, I guess, than even that, is that I'm, I'm a passionate believer in this democratic American e experiment in, in self-governance. And so many really influential and good things happened here in the 19th century that were attempts to foster or to move that experiment uh, along more quickly. <laughs> and. Uh, Given the challenges of today, we can learn from what happened and why. Um, and since it's us, it's good knowledge to have. So I am, um, last year I got asked to do a talk on abolition and I love talking about it, but to give a talk on it is very different from my perspective. Um, and I gotta make sure it didn't break. And. Um, not even up. Um, and we, um, this year I decided to update it a little bit. It was successful. And uh, I was, I always get nervous, but Norm and Milt came to the talk and I was I share, terrified. I share your feelings. And afterwards they came up, Milt said it was very good and Norm said it was good. And it was like, oh. <sighs> so this year I decided I'm going to make it when I do talks, if I feel like they're good, I try to make them then regionally centric. So um, I try to deep dive. So in Hamilton, I reached out to some folks and found they, they the college had the minutes for, um, not the Presbyterian, the Congregational Church. And it's really neat because anytime there was a seminal moment, Fugitive Slave Law Act is passed. 
there's a, uh, a note that we deride this, and here's why. Um, the Kansas-Nebraska Act is passed. Here's the note deriding it. Here's the resolution we passed, why we don't like it. So when, we, when I try to take it down to a lower level, um, in the Freedom Trail files, there was a note that Canastota had a convention in 1858 called the Great Anti-Slavery Convention. And there was an article, but nobody knew where the article was. So I reached out to the New York Archives, who has the microfilm, and said, hey, can I see this? They're sending it in. I'm going to find out about whatever this thing was in 1858, the Great Anti-Slavery Convention of Canastota. Um, and I take really pride in, number one, somebody else found those and made notes of them, and I'm just going to... But reminding people that wherever you are in our county, DeRider had a newspaper, an anti-slavery newspaper that was published out of DeRider. That's amazing. And wherever you go, you know, it doesn't matter. In Munsville, they had a school that was um, teaching African-American kids. You know, in the 1850s, right before the Civil War comes out. Um, so you have these little tidbits of wherever you are, something important. Even Nelson, uh, I got called last year by someone from the DAR who said, hey, we're putting up a historic marker about this guy. He was one of two people that received, I can't think of the name of the medal, but received this very prominent medal um, maybe three people. Now, come to find out, there was two versions of it, and he got the service medal. He didn't get the bravery. But he got the service medal because he served in the American Revolution for six years and then decided to settle in the town of Nelson. And that's where he died. We don't know where he's buried. We don't have 100% accuracy on exactly where his, his home was. But again, the town of Nelson, which is tiny and rural, and then you have the story of this American Revolution veteran um, so I always talk about, number one, we can take anything on a national level, and I can bring it down local, and I can tell you a story. Number two, wherever you live, and I'm biased to Madison County, but wherever you live across the state, I guarantee you there is a story from your tiny rural community that is incredibly important, not just to your total little rural community, but to the world as a whole. And even though it may not seem like it's a big deal, it is. Because that might have changed views that people had. It might have gotten people to think differently. And, and that's how we move forward. Um, and I don't know why I went off on this tangent, but... Um, yeah, but it's, it's right um, on point. So I guess what I would say is, as we finish, what makes you stay in Madison County now? Other than you're like me, it's family and, and the place you know. And um, what makes you proud of Madison County? Anita. Well, I'm proud of Madison County for all of those things and for all of those reasons. Um, and, you know, we, we've, still, we've got a, a ways to go yet on our melting pot. Um, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of smelting going on here. And, you know, that may be, maybe there isn't a whole lot of black people to get in there and get melted. But I think there could be more, and that wouldn't necessarily be a big issue. So, ultimately, the biggest reason why I, you know, and I've thought, I mean, I've reached a point in life where a lot of people are doing the snowbird thing, and, you know, uh, we could do that, I guess. You know, I had plans of spending time in Florida. I've never even considered that I would permanently live anywhere. Because for me, given my connections, to the, to the Underground Railroad and to Abolition and to Peterborough and the three generations that are in Peterborough Cemetery ahead of me, there's no way I'm going anywhere else. They will lay me out in Peterborough Cemetery next to my dad, hopefully, or somewhere close. And uh, that's just who I am. I tell people my roots go so far down into this Madison County soil, you can't dig me out of here. <laughs> I'll go visit for a while, but I'm coming home. <laughs>